Hello. Bom dia. Thank you, Janaina, Sophia, and Han for making it to this panel. Um, this is very exciting, and I understand it might be a little serious, uh, but at least it will give us context to the wonderful work that you guys have been doing. Um, so, welcome to Stagnant Water Bears Poison, National History and Personal Legacy. And I wanted to, Renee mentioned earlier that this is a quote actually from Wali Salimao, so I want to speak a bit about that and hope that we could connect um, the certain provocations that I've given to the artists in, in talking about their work. So, Stagnant Water Bears Poison is a line from Wali Salimao's poem, Anti-Travel. This is where he actually makes a very powerful paradox of staying within one's comfort zone. He calls this comfort zone like an enclosed well. So the familiar being a sticky layer, he ends this criticism of a narrow-minded experience with a line from William Blake's own poetry, expect poison from the standing water. So it is a precaution against growing stubborn in our worldview. This is a provocation to consider the ways that we venture to the unknown, to touch upon stories that continue to be told despite hegemonic erasure. It provokes us to question the changes that happen in our environments and societies and to follow the voices that live through these changes. And I think a lot of this um, sensibility is something that we can plug into in looking at the works of Janaina, Sophia, and Han. So in considering, though, the other part of this panel's title, National History and Personal Legacy, I hope to propose that we look at ways that artists and creative practices approach the dialectical tension in the erasure of collective local memory and the forgetfulness that comes with being part of global movements. Among Sophia, Han, and Janaina, we will get to know different methods of questioning official narratives of empire, state, and capital through multiple voices that overlap and diverge against these hegemonic histories. So their films, actually, if you please do have a chance to see them in full, their films up in um, the exposition um, in the fifth floor introduces very unique ways of storytelling. Um, for instance, with Janaina's work, which you will give context to, there is also the Sorry, the, the conversation with local voices from Ruropolis, and then it turns into this beautiful atmospheric reach into land and cosmos, even. For Sophia, uh, she has a very collaborative practice, um, and that means she works with people in the localities, in the territories, uh, that is, that, that's the subject of her films and the narratives are formed uh, through these interviews and engagements. For Han, it, for Pink Mao, for Han's Pink Mao, there is a look at the different circulation of capital and everyday objects and becomes a video essay that interrogates and overlaps and include different materials, different sources from popular media um, and you know, amidst the interrogation of these things that actually are in our everyday lives. So what I'm gonna do today to guide the panel, um, I will introduce the artists separately and then they will present um, and talk more about their work. So I will begin with Janaina Wagner. Um, she, uh, Janaina lives between Rubai, that's in Northern France and Sao Paulo. Her works are expressed in video, photography, installation, scenography, set design, and drawing. So referencing history, she draws together stories, facts, images, and memories to question progress and legacy. 
Janina's current project follows the subject of the Trans-Amazonian Highway as both an imaginary and a reality that impacts individuals and communities. Janaina, would you please speak more about Kebranchi and your work? Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. As Hene was saying, I know that Saturday morning is not the easiest one, so thank you for coming. Um, Quebranche, uh, this new film has the context of, well, it has the specific context of Video Brazil. So when I applied uh, to the biennial, I applied with a new work, and they asked me if I would be able to produce a new, a new work in such a short time. But it had been already maturing since my uh, previous short film that is called Kurupira and the Machine of the Destiny. That it's also a film that I shot in the same highway, in Transamazonica Highway, but in a different uh, piece of the road. Because this road is a very, very large road. Um, you can see it even as a, maybe a cut, maybe a scar. Depends on the time that you put on top of it because it's still a fresh scar, but it's also uh, a healed scar in some points. But anyways, it is a gigantic road that cuts Brazil from side to side. And that represents uh, this journey, this path to progress that was installed during the civic military dictatorship that Brazil went through uh, in the, from the 70s on. Um, so this other film that I shot, Curupira, uh, was already shot there. And I wanted to follow the, the path of the road almost seeing uh, the stories that are left behind and the stories that are still being uh, placed there until nowadays. So I see the road as this, as this cut and also as this um, bridge that can uh, bring good things also if you look to the stories that sur survive to it. Um, so it's important to say this because uh, this other film of mine was also shot there, but the landscape is completely different because uh, the road uh, is home to many different stories and to many different landscapes. So it's almost uh, infinite. And I had this uh, will, this desire of making this piece uh, that is from where this film Quebranche departs. That is a project from uh, the land artist, the American land artist Robert Smithson uh, from the 70s that exists only as a drawing and that was never accomplished neither by him, neither by other artists or creators. And I, for me, I've, I've seen this drawing once in an exhibition many years ago and I was thinking that, wow, how can nobody have ever uh, done it? And I was talking to some friends that study Robert Smithson, and they told me that uh, not from their knowledge, it's, it's not have been done yet. And it's called the, the Truly Underground Cinema, and it's a cinema inside of a cave. And he, he puts the moviegoer as a speleologist. And since I've been working from in my previous works with uh, land, with uh, huge uh, constructions, and with this parallel between uh, human construction and natural constructions, I thought that this idea of building a cinema inside of a cave, of looking inside of a stone, because as he puts the movie goer as a speleologist, I was thinking almost as uh, the movie goer as somebody that is going to crack up a stone and find out what it's inside of there. And this was the departing po point of the, of the film. And then doing the research for another film that I'm still developing, that I'm going to shoot next year, I, 
I met a group of speleologists. Uh, they have a group that is called Lights in the Darkness, Luzes na Escuridão. And they were the ones that told me that, ah, do you, wow. Uh, since we're talking about storytelling and about narratives, uh, this is something important also because it was really uh, the, the path to making the film and to find, to find the film that I wanted to do was very uh, organic and very... Uh, um, how do you call something when it's by chance? Like, it had a lot of luck inside because it was really some, one, one person that led me to the other one. And then he was telling me about this place, about this region in Amazonas, where they have the largest amount of caverns in the region. And, and then when he told me the name, that was Horopolis, I remember that I, that I knew the story of Horopolis from before, and that on a congress before I've met somebody that was a geologist, that told me about a lady, uh, that it's the lady that is pictured on the film, Eris Mar, that was, the, was known as the cave woman uh, of the place. So all of these dots, they began to be illuminated one by the other. So this is something that I find that it's nice also, that when you shed light on one point, uh, maybe when you shed light on a stone, is the reflect of the stone that illuminates the the one next to it. So the beginning of everything was trying to, was uh, this, I, this will to, this desire to, to build Robert Smithson cinema inside one of the caves that are under Transamazonica. Also trying to think about these two, almost like shapes, no? like the shape, that a, the shape that a cave has, that is almost like something round or something like a career bag, uh, if we think about that short story of Ursula Le Guin that tells about storytelling as a career bag. So maybe a, a cave is this, this little bag that keeps many stories inside. And this road as this uh, cut that cuts the road, no? that, that, cuts the, that cuts the stone, that cuts the cave. Uh, these two different uh, shapes uh, that exist. And like magically, these two shapes, I didn't need to invent them. They already exist. And this is something that I, that I like to do with my work. And I think that it's also like my, uh, my goal as an artist is not to, in to invent things that doesn't exist, but it's to find things that already exist and to, and not to show them because they are already there, but to maybe to rearticulate them or to touch them in a different way that will make them glow differently. Because uh, Eris Mar, she's there, she's alive, and all of her legacy is there, the caves are there. Even if I didn't do the film, they would be there. So it's not my existence that makes the, them exist. But maybe uh, connected, we can uh, bring other things also. And, and then there's this amazing story that Huropolis, this little town, uh, was built, was the first city built on the Transamazonica to, to serve as a base city for the workers. So it was a place that existed only uh, to something in, like only in relation to something else. Uh, it was an artificial city that was built only to build something else. So it was something that was not, uh, that it didn't have like the, um, uh, almost like the validation of existing by itself. And now, and Horopolis is by itself also. So it was, uh, what I wanted to do also was to, uh, to like to, to do this counter spell of coming back to this place and cheering its existence and everything that exists there. No. Um, 
And this was the, the departure point. Tell me if I'm being too long. <laughs> That's a great context to give about uh, Kibranchi. Um, Janina, will you be able to tell us or give us an idea if the process was similar or what was different um, with making this film? You said it was quite serendipitous, right? a lot of luck and finding. Is, do you feel that this is also the, this is the way that you make films? You know, how do you, how, how were your other projects like? Yeah, I think that uh, in terms of, I think if you work with a low budget, you have to be serendipitous because you have to count on chance. So maybe if I have more money eventually, I would need to plan better. But since now everything is so tight, uh, chance plays a really huge role on it. So this is also something like uh, the, the, the way that you produce something, you also reflects on the way on the on what you have afterwards and I, I like working this way with a small team with uh, tight things and then you need to take uh, the most of, uh, of everything and, and and so like the the what I, what I wanted to do was like to make a conversation between the stones and on the on the film there is a quotation of that poem of Wisława Samboja, the Polish poet. I'm not pronouncing her name properly, uh, but it's that it's called Conversation with a Stone. And I had this poem with me since many, many, many years and and it's super beautiful because it's a conversation with a stone and there is a moment where the stone says that all of its insides are tenet uh, are tenet out and uh, not inside, and that you can, you can break the stone into pieces, but each piece of it will still be a stone. So I was also trying to think about all of the stones that are the stones of the road, the stones of the caves, the stones of the construction of the city, uh, as a single uh, and autonomous beings, because even if you crack uh, a place into stones, all of those little bits and pieces, they're still going to be individuals, but not in, in, not into a humanizing way, but like single, single beings, no? And, and then I was thinking that the moon also is a stone. And then I thought that uh, maybe like the single witness that saw uh, the construction of the road and that saw everything was the moon. And then I, it was almost as if I wanted to make a conversation between the moon and the stones, and since the cave, the stones of inside the cave, they have never seen the moon, and the moon have never seen the inside of the caves, but they are all stones. I wanted to like tower through image to to put them together and to to show to the stones of the caves the moon, and to show to the moon the the stones of inside the caves, trying to. Uh, put this inside out. And this was also something that came from a previous film of mine that is called Lycanthropia, that is a, on the figure of the werewolf. And on this film, the narrator is the moon. So it's this, as if the moon is this huge witness of history. And also, like, not the sun, but the moon, like, trying to find this opposite uh, uh, balance power. And, and this was like, and then this was the goal of the film to bring the moon inside the stones t through image. Because also, like, since I am a, f I am an artist, I am a filmmaker. I am working through image. I am always uh, in my in my work, in my practice, trying to to see what is the power of image and what can image do as a, as a, when I say oh, spell and spell breaking as in Quebranto is almost trying to think about this this magical dimension of image that when you make when you make an image this this also exists so this this moon inside of the cave it really existed uh, while we were doing the the filming and while we were shooting it it was real and it was concrete and Thank you, Janaina. We'll be speaking more about um, your work and your process in the dialogue later on.
Thank you. So I'm happy to introduce um, Han now. Um, Tang Han is from Guangzhou, China, and is currently based in Berlin. Um, as a visual artist and filmmaker, her projects cut across the format of film, video, and painting. In her works, she interrogates the validity and currency of things that are taken for granted in everyday life. Han uses very subtle approaches of storytelling and perception. So she'll be speaking more about um, Pink Mao and hopefully you can also talk about your current project with the ginkgo one. Yeah. Um, hello. So um, my name is Tang Han and uh, thanks for coming. And I'm gonna to show a short video what I prepared before and uh, it's um, as a note to get know more about the some background uh, of the filmmaking of Pink Mao. Yeah. The initial driver for me to produce this work was what's going on in China today. Why I have lived in Germany for nine years. I go back to China once a year to meet my family and friends. But the experience is as if I'm pressing the fast forward button into the new era. Given how China has changed tremendously over the last few years, including the disappearance of physical cash through the growing cashless culture. I once went to a restaurant in a shopping mall in Shanghai and was rejected to pay 100 yuan in cash. This was when I realized the representation of Mao Zedong's portrait is faced with a crisis. Slightly before 1999, when China joined the WTO, the People's Bank of China printed a single portrait of Mao Zedong on all of the fifth generation bills and changed the color of the 100 yuan bills from the old gray color to pink. Though in reality, people generally consider the color of these bills as red. As demonstrated by a commonly used joke about calling them Red Grandpa Mao, when I question people around me, what color are the 100 yuan bills, they answer red as expected. I, on the other hand, always saw pink in these bills and have been interested in why people saw the red, which led me to think that it is not about our eyes' perceived colors, but about the difference in ideology. In addition, I was also interested in gender issues and as gender is often tied to colors, especially the stereotypical femininity with the color pink. I decided to incorporate this thinking to the piece. For those from my generation or younger who did not experience the Mao era, the implication of Mao Zedong's portrait is completely different from that of the older generations. I'm interested in learning what kind of new psychological implications will come out of near future. The sense of familiarity people feel towards existential image, those images that were unknowingly provided by someone and existing in every day without even being questioned, are one of the great interests I have always had. So, um, yeah, this was a very short introduction. So, um, actually, I, I have in this film, um, I'm trying to ask questions, but uh, maybe through the way I cannot get an very concretely answered, but, um, through the way I can learn more and understand more about the whole contest and doing some research about that. Um, so my, um, actually, so my, um, my process is always uh, trying to find some subtle things in everyday life and uh, trying to from start from these subtle things and link to another things. Yeah, this is what the way and uh, as my my approach to um, to start a project. Um, as you know, um, yeah, since uh, 1949, and 
in China, actually we have um, until now uh, in total five different um, editions of the renminbi banknote. So uh, at the very beginning, the image, uh, I think it was also very interesting to me because the image was like uh, there are uh, landscapes and workers uh, on labor and also some different minorities portraits. So, um, but finally, um, since the fourth edition of the banknote, and they changed it to four different leaders' portrait. And then in the uh, fifth edition, what we can see now, it's only a single portrait of Mao Zedong. And this is also since um, 1999, um, China uh, joined the WTO and uh, used Mao's portrait and printed on the banknote. It as a very strong, um, how to say, it's as a very strong symbol. Uh, and uh, to circulating in the global economy systems. So this is what I'm interested in, why um, this portrait and, um, and also the just, uh, just a position of the leader's portrait and uh, another hand, the color, yeah, with pink. So the just position of the pink and the leader portraits. So, um, so, yeah. um, what I find comes through often um, in your works, Han, is there is always an interweaving of everyday images and historical materials, but of course there are certain digressions, right, to visual culture. You're looking at iconography and strong symbol and popular media, right? So these are part of your work. Um, perhaps you can tell us a bit more about treating these subject matters as portraits. You told me about that, like even the ginkgo seeds were portraits. Yes, yes. Um, yes, this um, Pink Mao, this um, essay film, it's about the poetry, a leader's poetry, but my recent uh, and also ongoing project, it's about the ginkgo trees. It's that as, for me, is also a kind of portrait. I'm making a portrait about the trees, and I'm trying to uh, use this way and as a method to get understanding. Mm. For example, the uh, cultural historical relationship between the ginkgo and human, and also um, this project also started from very small and subtle um, things and questions. Uh, during the everyday life, yeah, because since the pandemic, we have fewer to do, so we walk around very often in the neighborhood, and yeah, very accidentally we find different uh, yeah ginkgo trees planted in our neighborhood on the street. Uh, but ginkgo trees was chosen as the street trees because um, the resistant to climate change, pollution, and pets. So um, people wanted to plant it. But very funny way is they, they only want to plant the male trees, but not the female trees, because female trees produce fruit. The fruits, if they get uh, under to the ground, it will become very smelly. Yeah. So the, the, this is also the way that why people don't want to yeah, plant, the, plant the female ginkgo tree, but sometimes they can't really control it. So you will always see some female ginkgo tree um, up on, on the street, yeah, and falling with fruit and smelly, people still complaining. So um, I'm, I'm just, um, yeah, because I saw these trees and also remind some of my family story about ginkgo trees, because in the countryside in China, uh, they still plant with ginkgo trees a lot at the 90s. A ginkgo tree was once very popular as a um, nutrition supplement, and then people will use that um, for healthy, and then they can sell very well. At that time, the price was so higher, they can even sell the nuts, and then in the same year, they can build up a new house. But later, it, uh, for example, at the 2000, the price was falling down, and then they started to selling the trees directly instead of selling the nuts. 
So, and this such story, um, I'm also interested in and wanted to incorporate into the new piece. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Han. Um, I think it's quite. It, it is interesting how um, through your projects, the value of things in history through history gets shown. You know, that's demonstrated. Like what you spoke earlier about um, the ginkgo trees contextually, and also, of course, in Pink Mao, there is a trace of that, and there is a question about the future of the actual currency. Yeah, thank you. I want to introduce Sofia Borges now. So Sofia Borges is an artist and filmmaker from Lisbon. She works in so she works in Portugal in Sao Tome e Principe, where her projects get developed in public spaces, as installations and films. These projects are presented in informal contexts as well, as well as sorry as well as in academia, exhibitions and film festivals. Sophia's works are research-based and collaborative, and I think this is what we're gonna be speaking about, your process with that. Through engagements and long-term participations with the localities which become the subject of her works. So her work in Video Brazil um, is titled 53, after the massacre of 1953, Please, Sophia. Bom dia. Um, primeiro que tudo, eu queria agradecer à Bienal, ao SESC e, e a quem devo agradecer o facto de terem convidado para estar aqui e apresentar o, o 53 e poder uh, depois partilhar com todas, tudo o que pude partilhar com todos os que estão aqui presentes. Uh, portanto, eu estou aqui, eu vi aqui apresentar um filme que se chama 53. Este filme foi realizado em, em Santo Tomé e Príncipe. Eu sou portuguesa e vou passar a fazer uma apresentação para quem não sabe onde é que se localiza Santo Tomé e Príncipe e, e um pouco da história da relação entre Portugal e Santo Tomé. E queria, Santo Meio Príncipe, e queria que não tomassem isto muito a sério. Eu só estou a fazer a contextualização, porque senão ninguém percebe qual é a intenção do, do trabalho. Não tomassem a sério os dados históricos, ou seja, é, uma, é um contexto, não é uma, uma validação, digamos assim, histórica. Portanto, Santo Meio Príncipe localiza-se no, no, em África, Uh, junto, uh, portanto, a cerca de 300 quilómetros do, do Gana, é atravessado pela linha, pela linha do Equador uh, e está muito perto, a cerca de 50 quilómetros da linha de, de, de Greenwich. Um, é, é constituído por, por duas ilhas, a ilha de Santo Tomé e a ilha de Príncipe, e... A minha intenção de ir para Santo Tomé teve realmente a ver com a relação que Portugal teve com Santo Tomé e Príncipe. Santo Tomé e Príncipe teve durante cinco séculos, digamos assim, aprisionado, foi construído nessas duas ilhas, construiu-se o interposto comercial de escravos e construiu-se uma economia baseada na escravatura que durou até à, à, portanto, ao, ao fim oficial, digamos assim, da escravatura. Nessa altura, uh, o, o, o governo colonial português, não tendo uh, mão de obra suficiente para, uh, de, digamos, para continuar com o sistema digamos que económico uh, uh, de, de produção, Uh, uh, cria um sistema que é um sistema de, 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 de contratos, digamos falsos contratos, uh, que recorre a pessoas uh, 
que vivem em Angola, em Moçambique e em particular em Cabo Verde, que era um, um, uma zona um, onde uh, havia muita pobreza, muita carência e as pessoas são uh, aliciadas a irem para Santo Tomé para trabalhar com contratos. Quando chegam a Santo Tomé, reparam-se, uh, deparam-se com, com situações obviamente não eram situações de contrato e, e o trabalho, digamos que é, continua, a exploração é continuada desta forma e isto dura até uh, 1975, o ano da independência de, de Santo Tomé e Príncipe. Depois há outra situação que é a, part... a independência de Santo Tomé e Príncipe, entretanto, Santo Tomé querem, por exemplo, viajar para Portugal, não o conseguiram fazer este ano, em fevereiro, foi assinado um acordo entre os países que falam língua oficial portuguesa, em que as pessoas podiam ter já mais alguma, mais alguns, alguma possibilidade de circulação, um contrato, digamos que de um ano, que se possibilitava às pessoas viajar, que possibilita viajar para Portugal, não saindo de Portugal, portanto não podem utilizar o espaço europeu, só o espaço português, e durante um ano têm que, a possibilidade, digamos assim, de ter um contrato de trabalho, não se percebe muito bem o que é que, o que, é que irá acontecer depois. Digamos assim. Estou a dar este contexto só para se perceber uh, uh, qual é que... Qual é que foi, que relação é que foi, digamos assim, estabelecida e que existe ainda, ainda atualmente, ainda existe atualmente. Uh, o, o filme, o 53, é um filme um, uh, que é ficcionado uh, a partir de, de, de uma conversa entre um curandeiro e um espírito uh, de um homem que foi morto durante o massacre de 1953 que ocorreu em Santo Meio Príncipe. Um, e foi, foi feito a partir de testemunhos uh, de uh, últimos sobreviventes do massacre e uh, com testemunhos de, também de, das pessoas uh, que participaram no filme, quer os atores, não atores, como intérpretes de língua Santo Tomé e Príncipe, ou seja, todas as pessoas que participaram, Santo Menses que participaram diretamente no filme, deram o seu testemunho uh, através de, digamos, de, 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 de experiências familiares, porque eram mais novos. E a partir destas conversas nós começámos a, a, a criar, digamos, uma, uma narrativa que sustentou, digamos, esta conversa entre um, entre um curandeiro e, um, e, um, e, um, e um, uma pessoa que foi morta durante o, durante o, o massacre. O, só um bocadinho para explicar, o massacre ocorreu em 1953, um, Uh, não se sabe quantas pessoas é que morreram durante, durante o massacre. Nessa altura foi criado um campo de concentração que eu, até chegar a Santo Tomé, pensei que era um campo de trabalho forçado, mas não era um campo de trabalho forçado, porque uh, uh, os testemunhos diretos de, de, das pessoas que tiveram no, no, em Fernão Dias era que foram torturadas, portanto, elas tinham que retirar água, ou eram obrigadas a tirar água do mar em barris e a despejar na areia, portanto, isso consecutivamente, obrigadas a, a carregar barris de madeira com água e com, tinham pregos, os barris tinham pregos no, na, e, e estavam sobre a cabeça, Havia uma, uma, uma casa de, onde tinha uma cadeira com, com de choques, que dava choques elétricos para forçar as pessoas, obviamente, a confessarem que estavam a participar contra as forças coloniais. Portanto, este foi o ambiente em Fernão Dias que sucedeu ou foi simultâneo ao massacre não sei, não sei obviamente, não, eu não consigo dizer se uma coisa antes ou vem depois obviamente que isto está tudo interligado um, uh, o objetivo deste filme, deste filme foi realmente um primeiro objetivo era poder divulgar isto no, em Portugal, portanto, fazer um, comunicar diretamente com, com Portugal, dizer, olha, isto aconteceu, 
porque é, não, é um, não, é um tema, não é um tema que é abordado é recentemente até tem sido mas é sempre um, num, num, num contexto muito muito limitado um, e por outro lado era uma vontade de incorporar digamos os testemunhos os testemunhos e ao mesmo tempo dialogar com a memória a memória um, a memória e a experiência que a população tinha sobre uh, e, o colonialismo de uma forma geral e de uma forma particular sobre o massacre e sobre Fernão Dias. Uh, e, e, o Fernão Dias, uh, um, neste momento, é, é, um, é, um, é um lugar uh, onde, todo, onde todos os anos, no dia 3 de fevereiro, a população se desloca da cidade, uh, é cerca de... 10, 10 km da cidade, da capital de, de Santo Tomé, e a população desloca-se, uh, uh, desloca jo, muitos jovens a pé, uh, uh, deslocam-se para, para Fernão Dias uh, no dia 3 de fevereiro. Entre o dia 2 e o dia 3, muitos familiares se juntam durante a noite a fazer uma vigília em, 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 nessa zona. Portanto, é, 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 é algo muito forte, é, é algo muito, muito forte, obrigada, Ana. É algo, é algo muito forte. Agora, assim, em dois minutos, que acho que é o, o que se tem, uh, o, que eu, o que eu tenho, um, uh, queria só referir que... Houve, outra, houve, houve outros objetivos que, que possivelmente não vou conseguir desenvolver agora, mas um importante foi, por exemplo, a trabalharmos com, a, a partir da língua, da língua de Santo Tomé. Há, em Santo Tomé diz, há pessoas que dizem língua de Santo Tomé há duas, e também chamam língua forro porque era uma, era uma, foi uma, é uma língua de uma zona muito específica de Santo Tomé. Portanto, houve esta intenção também de de aproveitar o facto de estar a fazer o, o filme também ser um, um veículo, digamos assim, de, de preservação e, e também porque nos ajudaria a pensar, ou seja, a incorporar o pensamento seria incorporado através da língua, seria um, havia, há um, havia uma perspectiva de, de, de pronto, de, de, e é o que acontece, a língua uma língua é pensamento, portanto, era utilizar a língua Santo Tomé para conseguir incorporar mais as intenções de, de, das experiências que foram recolhidas. Quando we estávamos falando sobre línguas, um, the other day, you were talking about a way of thinking, like that's also a preservation of lifestyle of a certain kind of cultural history. Like how can we pass on and preserve that worldview? And these engagements are important. So do you think then the, re the protection or the preservation of the Sao Tome language is part of that concept that you are speaking about? Sim, um, tá, um, sim eu, eu acho que é importantíssimo, é, é urgente, uh, porque um, um, eu ainda não consegui, não sei se algum dia vou conseguir perceber, uh, eu, não, eu não sei falar a língua Santo Tomé, mas sei, em Santo Tomé fala-se português, Uh, fala-se português com o pensamento da língua de Santo Tomé e isso eu consegui uh, através daí perceber uh, digamos que, que o, o quão importante era, era se, se seria a, a utilização da língua ne, neste contexto em relação ao que me estavas a perguntar um, o, eu, a personagem do filme que é o, o espírito do homem morto é o Honório Soares o Honório Soares, quando eu o conheci ele disse-me eu sou pescador e sou bailarino e eu disse, uau, como é que isto é possível ser pescador e ser bailarino 
e ele é pescador e é bailarino e é, e é músico e é diretor artístico de um, de um, de um grupo uh, de, de dança e teatro de Santo Tomé, primeiro grupo masculino, mas já criou o grupo feminino há alguns anos atrás, portanto tem dois, tem dois grupos, ele faz tudo isto. E eu, mas o, o que eu sinto é, é, eu não sei até quando, porque Santo Tomé não tem, não tem recursos, digamos, económicos suficientes, um, eu não sei até quando é que isto vai ser possível, porque o Honório Soares, por exemplo, faz um sacrifício brutal em relação à sua vida privada e familiar, as condições de vida que ele tem, em, 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 digamos assim, para não, de, para, não, para não deixar de fazer, de, de, de fazer as suas atividades, atividades culturais, ou seja, ele faz um sacrifício enorme em termos pessoais, tem umas condições de vida muito difíceis, difíceis para conseguir transportar, digamos assim, o legado que lhe foi deixado. Se, lhe disse, se ele for para o mar, mas se for preciso, ele, ele, se ele ia para o mar e se era necessário, por exemplo, ir a um, a um, dar um apoio num, 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 num funeral ou numa recepção, e o Honório Soares vai e deixa de ir ao mar e depois chega à casa e não tem meio de sustento para a família, por exemplo, ou tem mais dificuldade em o ter. O que eu pergunto é como é, que, como é que isto vai ser possível no futuro? Ou seja, como é que, como é que vai ser possível dar, dar continuidade, um, continuidade? Sim. Tem que ser eu, eu queria dizer uma, só, só uma coisa. Desculpa, é para isto não ficar com uma coisa tipo pesada e, e, e eu, eu digo isto um, porque porque o, o que eu encontrei, por exemplo, em Santo Tomé, foi um é um eu, o que eu queria dizer é que é um pensamento único, ou seja, que é um pensamento específico de cada cultura. E, e é nisso que eu estou preocupada, não é? Não é? Não estou? É não não se deixar perder isso. E como é que não? Como é que nós conseguimos que isso não se perca? Essa, essa, essa que é um conhecimento que tem a ver com o, 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 o conosco humanos, com, com, com o ser humano. É um conhecimento que é um conhecimento que tem a ver com o conhecimento da natureza e que se pode, que é um é o um conhecimento da humanidade e como é que isto não é não, não se vai como é que nós não deixamos perder isto era neste sentido que eu queria que eu queria que eu queria que eu queria dizer sim thank you for your presentation for everyone's presentation about their works um, there is a thread that I was hoping to propose this was something that I brought up with um, Sophie and Han the other day, but the notion of micro-histories um, and how your films or the way that you've made connections with the subjects of your work, including the formalisms, formalisms as in, um, in cinema and in filmmaking, how they attempt to, or at least they have the possibility of connecting to massive um, macro-scale events having that and also the small local events, individual units and groups, and these could be more than human, um, the environment, and this could be testimonies um, from history. Um, I, I wonder what you think about that framework. So this is an open question for all of you, as the audience can you know, think about their questions or comments to give. Is that something that you perhaps think about, Janaina? Because there is the more than human aspect, right, to, to your concerns in making films. Yeah, but you, you mean the micro histories or the other than human? Uh, the, the micro histories, yeah. like now what's, what's the sort of, artistic agency and framework um, more than human yeah. and environment is, is part of this language and method of micro histories. Yeah. 
I really think that uh, we as human beings, we are micro, no? So our history, our own history is micro, our history as uh, single beings. And so I, uh, I believe in, in this, that the, the micro histories can change a broader history because uh, our lives are, are made by the connection that we have towards each other. So it is really, uh, there is always like this broader history that we are players inside, but the life, like on daily basis, it, it is built by us and by the people that are by our sides. And for me, it was really also another serendipity thing of the film that the character, uh, Eris Mar, she's a teacher because I, I am sure that many things that I that I've accomplished in my life, they they are thanks to teachers that crossed my path uh, and that showed me something. Uh, not necessarily that teached me something, but that showed me something. So I don't know when, when we are uh, children and when we are in the university. I always remember, like specifically in university, one of the first works that a teacher, an important teacher of mine showed me and that made me look to things in a different way. And I, has, I have a practice as a teacher. I'm not working as a teacher now, but I was doing, I was working in a, in a school, in a middle school, normal, uh, with children from seven to 14 years old for a few years, I think, around six years, this was, I, I had this job. And for me, it was always this opportunity. And besides like what you need to teach, because it, it is on the program, and you have to fill the parameters, and you have to like teach a certain number, uh, number of things, was, I was aware of the influence that, my, that, that I, I, I would play on them. Because this was at least like in, the, in a good way, this was what happened to me. And in a bad way also, because a teacher can also be somebody that is responsible for traumas and for exposing your uh, fragilities in a bad way. So also like this film is also an homage, not just to it is Mar, to this teacher, but to the other teachers, because they are really like the the small warriors, no, like the the minuscule warriors that built uh, the future in a very cheesy and corny way, but yeah. It's interesting as well, Janina, that there is resonance to perhaps this worldview, right, that, that teach and the relationships that teachers have, because Erismar, Miss Erismar, it was mentioned in your film, it was out of curiosity and being just self-driven to go into the caverns. And that's where all of these paintings, oh, cave paintings were discovered before it was even institutionalized. So there's also this aspect of touching onto something a lot more bigger and, her, her, and having that connection and that relationship um, to yeah, something bigger. Yeah. yeah, totally, because a teacher is somebody that, that is curious, but uh, that wants also to pass its curiosity f uh, forward. So I think it's a very amazing and a very important and amazing profession no? to, to be this. And Ms. Erismar, yeah, I think she's, what interested me also in her is that I think that like this uh, curiosity that she talks about and this attraction that she had for the holes and for this unknown and for the darkness, 
I think that many of us, we feel this also, no, we don't, and then we can, we escalonate this in our own lives, like if it's more or if it's less. But I think this drive of going to a place that you don't know, and this was, was um, what amazed me the most at her, because I was asking her, how can you, how did you have the courage to go inside a dark place that is dark and that you don't know what is inside? Because she would go inside only with a candle. And, and I think that I was afraid, like on the film, that this would make a parallel with something that can be described as um, colonization discoveries. Because if you think about even like in the, the discovery of the Americas, it was almost like as astronauts. If you take a boat and you just go uh, forward and you don't know what you're going to meet, it, it requires a courage that is very specific. And this would be maybe the, the bigger history, but then I was like trying to find these little explorers and astronauts and uh, that are the teachers maybe, yeah. Han, would you like to speak about perhaps the development and the shifts of iconography and the, you know, the power of symbolism and how that follows through different shifts in history? Is that part of um, your work? Is this part of what you're thinking about? Um, yes, for me, um, in my work, I, I use different appropriate uh, elements and uh, which I also found in internet as a found footage and also um, different like uh, f um, different materials from the archive or the uh, older books, uh, literature. Um, and this is what the way I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, put them together. And I still believe the, the subtle things uh, are rooted together. So it's, if, I, if we can image that, for me, it's more like the, the, there are roots and then they are tangled together. It's even a very subtle and tiny things. And then they, they can still link to another things. And, and then maybe that can also bring us to a, maybe the big history and also different cultural contests. Yeah, that is that's just what I think about it. Sophia, you often also mention um, a very important occasion for you is the February 3 memorialization, right? And how I see this is kind of this collective vernacular memory. And in a way, in your film, what happens with the two different narrators, things get overlapped, like you start not knowing who is speaking, would that constitute as that blanket, not, sorry, not blanket, but collective, this kind of collective memory, working together, converging together? O objetivo de fazer de fazer este filme foi 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 realmente tentar ir ao encontro uh, daquilo que eu denominei como e que tu estás a falar de memória a memória coletiva de, do colonialismo português em Santo Tomé uh, foi um trabalho feito um, foi um trabalho feito a partir da rua ou seja foi, foi num contacto direto com pronto com com, com a população numa primeira fase e depois numa outra fase foi realmente numa aproximação já ao massacre de 53 com os sobreviventes e com os intervenientes de, intervenientes digamos do filme e eu tentei que fosse digamos que, que porque é sempre uma tentativa Tentei, tentei, o esforço foi no sentido de incorporar 
o, o máximo possível uh, uh, aquilo que estava a ser discutido e que se estava a ser dito e as experiências, digamos, diretas dos que, das pessoas que estiveram no massacre e, por outro lado, o que era comum, o que era comum à população. As pessoas, quando, 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 fal, quando falam de Fernão Dias, falam sempre desse acontecimento que eram forçadas a tirar água, água do mar e, e com barris e, e despejá-las uh, despejá na, na terra. Portanto, uh, uh, de casas incendiadas, de pessoas que tinham que, na altura do massacre, porque o massacre começou em, em 3, 2 para 3 de fevereiro e continuou durante o mês de de fevereiro, que os homens tinham que dormir em cima das palmeiras para uh, vigiar, para uh, conseguirem dormir, porque se dormissem nas casas uh, podia vir uma batida policial e levá-los para Fernão Dias, portanto tinham que dormir uh, em, cima, em cima das palmeiras, mas um dia que estavam a dormir em cima das palmeiras viram as suas próprias casas arder, portanto, uh, ou seja, houve... Há, Há, houve esta tentativa de incorporar uh, 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 de, os testemunhos diretos. Portanto, ao, ao, ao uh, verem o 53, uh, uh, os diálogos são uh, trans, é uma construção, uma narrativa criada com vários fragmentos de, 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 das histórias e de experiências diretas partilhadas. Pronto. Respondi ou não? Ou é preciso mais alguma coisa? Uh, that that's very clear, Sophia. That the, the the it's very the idea of the, the fragments coming together too, and that this is something that um, people who go, people visit the February three memorialization, like this is embedded. Like this is these are stories, these are actions that um, they know. Thank you. Okay. Are there comments from the audience or perhaps clarifications that you'd like to have? Isaac. And one more here. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, uh, I have a question actually for Tang Han. Thank you for also sharing your work. And my question actually is more like focusing on this uh, I would like to know more about like, the younger generation uh, in China. How do they look at the idea of, let's say, communism and capitalism? In your work, we see that you're using a banknote, and in this banknote, we see Mao, and we also, I mean, like, uh, like to, let's say, look back at the Cultural Revolution in China that was more like trying to look for this uh, Chinese communism. And um, also, like that was also what Mao was proposing. And now, when Mao's face is like all over the place in the banknote, which also is being circulated in in China or all over the world, and it would be great to get to know more about like the public and the the young generation. How do they see this part of history, and at the same time, like the ideal ideologies of uh, of that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac, for this very good question. Um, for me, uh, me as a younger generation uh, who did not experience the, the mouse era, and or maybe even more younger, they and they don't, yeah, they they don't have such experience. It's uh, quite. Um, different if we compare with our parents' generation or even older, and uh, the meaning of the Mao's portrait. So um, for me, actually, it's uh, at the very beginning. It's a little bit difficult for me to pick up this as my subject matter because uh, you know, Mao. It's a very big figure that um, every, everyone knows it and also it's so famous and Andy Warhol also did this you know, like a seal screen 
yeah, about his portrait, and also um, and Mao's portrait also circulated uh, because the communists and in and also circulated the prints in all over the world. Um, it's uh, but for me, it's more like uh, as a younger generation, I would like to use my perspective to maybe. Uh, how I understand this big figure for me, and also uh, think about um, so uh, I, I forgot something. <laughs> Sorry, um, like the maybe um, it's the the meaning is also during the time it changed a lot, and also the digitalization of nowadays about the payment and also the censorship issues. Um, so that's also made me think about this portrait maybe slowly disappearing in nowadays because uh, it changed to the digits and like uh, into our maybe the payments way, like the digital payment. And uh, also, um, the, it's losing the physical form. Yeah. So this is what I'm interested in. I'm trying to, yeah, in my film to elaborate such questions. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Ei, hey, bom dia. Muito obrigado. Foi uma mesa. Bom dia, muito obrigado. Foi uma mesa incrível e muito legal é, no, na montagem colocar esses três trabalhos na conexão. Fica muito potente para a gente como público conhecendo os trabalhos, pensar nessas questões aí da história nacional, das questões da memória. Então, muito obrigado e parabéns. Bom, uma pergunta para cada uma, assim. É, para a Tang, eu gostaria de saber como que seu trabalho circula na China. E como que, inclusive em relação à primeira questão que você respondeu, como que as gerações mais antigas, seus pais e avós, por exemplo, entram em contato com o modo com que você simbolicamente manejou a imagem do mal. É, para a Sofia... É, bom, a gente até teve a oportunidade de conversar. O seu trabalho, sobretudo para nós no Brasil, é extremamente tocante, é, porque também a gente viveu processos de colonização de Portugal e é uma questão urgente também para a gente agora dar, dar um pouco de conta disso. Queria te perguntar, bom, em relação ao cinema de Portugal, né? a Suzana, a Souza Dias, o Pedro Pinho e essas pessoas todas que estão envolvidas ali, como é que o seu trabalho dialoga com o trabalho deles e em que medida? né é, porque em alguns momentos parece que tem uma certa um certo desejo do, do cinema português de dar conta dessa história que foi muito encoberta eu lembro que uma vez numa palestra da Suzana ela disse que tinha uma certa imagem em Portugal de que tinha sido uma colonização soft que não tinha sido tão violenta bom a gente sabe como é que foi eu queria que você comentasse isso um pouco e mais uma vez parabéns pelo seu trabalho e para Janaína eu queria que você comentasse um pouco é um trabalho lindo também, a gente conversou um pouco, né? é incrível o modo com que a gente fica imerso ali perto da pedra, e acho que o tamanho da sala favoreceu muito isso, né? da gente ficar ali pertinho assim, cria um clima muito interessante. Eu queria que você comentasse um pouco sobre a coisa da Transamazônica mesmo, porque sobre o projeto da Transamazônica, que aparece muito fortemente no seu filme, mas que aqui eu não sei, para as pessoas que não são do Brasil, se é possível compreender o, o lado simbólico todo que está nesse grande pro, pro, é, processo de progresso que era o ideário da ditadura militar ao construir a Transamazônica. Muito obrigado. Ok, thank you very much for your comment and questions. So uh, what I can answer is, um, so uh, I, I will use my own experience to answer the questions because um, 
Uh, as you know, so I, I have been live in Germany already for more than 10 years. And it's this such experience um, influenced me a lot. That also gave me a kind of distance to look back what happened in China today. But sometimes I, sometimes I will feel like uh, I'm an outsider. Yeah, even I'm a Chinese. Yeah, because uh, I have already like um, um, live in different uh, country and uh, experience different culture, and. Uh, the, the feeling is always like I'm being an in-betweener from both country and cultural. So uh, it's always for me very important uh, how to deal with yeah, the materials from uh, what I grow up yeah, as a Chinese and then later I came to Germany for studied and working. Um, so uh, your your question was so uh, um, like uh, if I, I don't know how uh, I I didn't show uh, pink Mao in China yet until now. Uh, yes, I I had um, but but that's uh, luckily it, I had um, I had a chance to show it at some film festivals such as uh, in Taiwan and also in Tokyo, but which also have some dialogue. Um, like the um, to trace it back to the uh, Asia um, background, yeah, and that's uh, also f uh, I thought about my audience, um, who will be my audience, then who wants know that and understand the 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 perspective of what I this discuss about it, yeah, so. Um, yeah, I, I don't know uh, if um, I already answered the question or, uh, yeah. Ah, yes. Yes, uh, for example, that's very personally because uh, my parents, uh, they still very believe the party and also um, they they also think about um, the parties, uh, what they do are very great. And because for them, the generation from them, it's like they experienced a kind of hard time period. <laughs> and then the later they come, to come and uh, with the raising economy, and yeah. And, and, but for me, it's, um, I still keep the, the critical thinking about uh, how our life now, and even in the context of the raising economy, and also, yeah, think about another yeah, <laughs> discussion. Would people like your parents, for instance, would they see their work? Would they be okay? With their uh, they are actually my parents uh, when they saw my work. Um, uh, they are okay. They don't think that so much critical because they <laughs> that that's so funny yeah and but uh yeah but i've never got the chance to show at the moment in china yeah so thank you o meu percurso o meu percurso artístico é um eu eu não eu não trabalho apenas com cinema eu trabalho com cinema quando tenho alguns meios económicos que me permitam fazer. Portanto, eu, eu tenho uma formação em belas artes, em pintura, mas o meu, o meu percurso atravessa, é, 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 atravessa diferentes, diferentes suportes. Eu, eu tive 10 anos naquilo com um grupo de pessoas no que se chama, nós chamamos aqui, chamamos bairro autoconstruído, portanto, era um bairro que foi construído pelas próprias pessoas Uh, uh, algumas delas provenientes, umas nos anos 60 do norte de Portugal e outras a partir de, 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 de independência, portanto, provenientes de Angola, de Moçambique, Cabo Verde, portanto, eu estive aí 10 anos, entre 2006 e 2016, e fiz um, 
um, um, na altura, o último projeto que fizemos ali foi a construção de um jardim, uh, porque o bairro foi demolido e as árvores iam ser demolidas e haviam árvores com 40 anos. Então, fez um, um, uh, uh, encontrou-se um espaço e, e construiu-se um jardim com com uh, 20 espécies botânicas entre árvores e plantas e um arquivo online que está online das as espécies que haviam no, no, no local com a identificação dos moradores, como é que os moradores queriam uh, que elas fossem lembradas em termos de, da forma como as utilizavam. Eu estou-me a desviar um bocadinho, mas também está-me a dar um bocadinho de, de, de prazer estar a falar no, no projeto. Pronto, isto para dizer que o meu percurso não é um percurso uh, 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 de cinema, portanto, eu não estou uh, completamente, uh, digamos que, inserida de um contexto, uh, digamos, do cinema. O meu posicionamento em relação ao cinema, obviamente que eu tenho uh, inspirações no cinema português e referências, uh, por exemplo, um, o trabalho do Pedro Costa é um, é, uma, é um trabalho que eu tenho acompanhado e em relação, a, a, houve um posicionamento que eu tomei que foi, eu não quero trabalhar com os arquivos, de, de, dos arquivos, digamos, de, de colonia, coloniais, com o arquivo português colonial. Portanto, daí eu acho que há um posicionamento que é, eu vou para Santo Tomé, vou ouvir as pessoas, o que é que elas têm para dizer e tentar que seja através, digamos, sendo que isto tem limites, eu sou portuguesa, mas pronto, tentar que, que, que sejam as pessoas, a, a tentar que as pessoas contrassem a sua própria história e não recorrer outra vez, que acho que é uma violência enorme. Eu deparei-me com um filme, uma violência, que estava ao meu lado o, a personagem que era o, que era o, portanto, o pescador, o Anário Soares, e eu fui ver um filme com ele e estava cheia de vergonha, porque o que é vergonha e pedi-lhe imensas desculpas porque era uma violência enorme ele estar a ser confrontado, quer dizer, outra vez com, com, com o mesmo. Mas porquê? Eu, eu estava envergonhadíssima, porque era, era novamente a ser confrontado com, 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 com violência. Uh, pronto. Uh, portanto, há este posicionamento, que é, uh, eu não quero trabalhar com, 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 com o arquivo português e, e tentar esta utopia, porque isto também é, tem, tem as suas questões, obviamente, mas tentar que a voz parta do, 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 do outro do lugar. Mm. So, uh, for me, the oddest part of the, of the weird part of the building of this road that is called Transamazonica is that as the, as the people that live uh, around Pará and Amazonas, that are the two states that the road crosses, uh, they call the construction of the road as the colonization time. So it's like if there was a second colonization of, of Brazil, but a colonization from the inside. Uh, Brazil is a very huge country, and this road was part of a, of a project to integrate the country. So they would say that we would, they, they the civic military dict uh, government, Uh, would say that it would be needed to integrate so it, we wouldn't deliver uh, all of the all of the uh, uh, good things that the forest and that the that huge part of land would proportionate uh, to other countries. So it was like the, 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 the main slogan of it, I think it was to, uh, how, do you, how do you take something that is, uh, that is not yours if you, if you Yeah, if you colonize it by 
by by by by your own by your own country. So even uh, Erismar and the other people that I met during the during the making of the film, they call this moment uh, of time uh, as the colonization time. Even though we are in the 70s and we are not in the uh, in the in the time of the colonization of Brazil. And what they do, uh, there was this huge uh, land that was filled with people, indigenous communities and other people that were already there. But the propaganda would say that it was a desert land that needed to be occupied. And then something that was very specific for this film that it was uh, uh, something that happened by chance also, when I was looking to this propaganda, because they would refer to they would be they would refer to Amazonas as the Green Inferno, a Green Inferno that needed to be conquested. So it was this idea of salvage land, empty salvage land that needed to be occupied. Because if we Brazilians didn't occupy it, another country would come and occupy it and take the 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 goods of the land, uh, the the natural resources of the land, to its own. So I found this propaganda that would say that uh, there is, uh, quoting, there is something odd with the, with, the, with the tiny solitude of Amazonas. And tiny in Portuguese is the, I found the translation of tiny, is the name of a, a metal that is, in Portuguese is estanho, that if it, there is a, a correspondence with estranho, so it's tiny and odd, like the the correspondence between words. So they would say that there is something odd with this green solitude of Transamazonica. So it does it, it cannot be just uh, green as a land. It needs to be occupied, and we as Brazilians we need to take it in our own control. Otherwise, we will lose this huge. Uh, resource base uh, of Brazil. So it is a place, uh, these both states, Amazonas and Pará, that were looked at as just as uh, something that you would be, um, just like extractivist uh, land. So we, it, it was a piece of land that was looked at something that, just as the resource that you can take and the most advantage that you can take out of it. And then this project that came also with the road, because once you put the road, you connect that, that area to other areas of the country, and you make the access to it more easily. So they, they, set this, uh, they, they started to build this road, and it was a, a road that was built without any care of the land and of the communities that were already there and of the people that were already there. And they set up as a almost like a, a I'm losing the words even in Portuguese, so it's okay. But it, like they would call workers from the entire Bra the entirety of Brazil to come there and to populate this place because they would say that it was an unpopulated place. So Erismar, for instance, she is from Maranhão. She's from another place, but she came there. Uh, her parents came there to work on the construction of the road, to work on the construction of the cities. So it was really this movement of taking people from all of the Brazil and putting it there to build something different and to build something that would be approachable for the for the the the, the, the dictatorship that was in place. And. The propaganda of the time, it's very interesting. If you look up in the internet, if you put uh, construction of Transamazonica uh, propaganda, you will, say, uh, you will see many interesting, like in terms of image, uh, interesting propaganda. As I said, it was referred to as the Green Inferno, as this land without people, and I don't know what else I can see. Do you think it's it's the the count? Sim. Imagine. Ah, and something interesting is that 
the, the president of Brazil at the time was a general, Emilio Garastal Medici, and the hotel that we shoot, it is called Hotel Presidente Medici. And the hotel was built because this president spent a week there, and only for his staying there, for the inauguration of Horopolis, this hotel that was a five-star hotel at the time was built. So they have this pool with uh, HPM, Hotel President Majesty, that was built there. And it was really like this OVNI built in the middle of the, of the, of the forest. And again, like the stones, they were also used as landmarks. No, like there is one of the pictures that I put there, there is a stone with a plaque saying about the inauguration of the place. So also, almost if the stones, they were forcibly used to as monuments for this uh, constructive destruction. We appreciate all the work that you guys do and all of these contexts and communities that you are participating in, um, in making, and also while alongside making your films. We've reached the end of our event for this particular event. Thank you again, Janaina, um, Sophia, and Han. Please do check out their films upstairs and we will be around a little bit if you'd like to speak more to them. So thank you all for joining us.